All right. Welcome, welcome. It is so good to have so many of you here today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Kara Robicek. Uh, I am the Deputy Director and Network Manager at Energy Action Network. And if any of you, yay. If anyone needs an introduction to Energy Action Network, um, we are two things. We are this wonderful network of all of you, and um, we love to get the chance to bring people together to talk about energy and climate issues and how we can um, make improvements. And very excited for this speaker series here today. And we're also excited for our summit. So if you want to save the date for that, we're going to be bringing a much bigger group of people together at Bolton September 18th. So we will be starting to plan that over the next few days and weeks. Um, the other thing we do, of course, is that we put together that report that Jared's going to hold up uh, there in the back. And we are currently, right now, in the process of uh, writing the 2024 report. So any feedback you have at the moment, this is a good time to give that to us. Before I hand over to our speakers, I want to just cover a few logistical items. Um, we will have some time for Q&A near the end of the, the event here, the, the end of the hour. So if you want to you know, make a note of your questions as they arise, we'll make sure that we make some space for that. Um, there is a restroom, always important to know where that is. It is over through that arch doorway, that direction, if folks are looking for that. I also want to point out that we are recording this today. We have someone here from Orca Media who is recording this, and, and the, the panel may be on television, so you can remember that as you're giving your remarks. Um, very excited to have that, that resource here today as well. Um, so, our, our panel here, we are so excited to have these folks here to talk to us about um, high mileage drivers and how we can maybe help them to get into electric vehicles. So Karen Glipman, former EAN board member, many of you probably know her, she currently works for the Center for Sustainable Energy. Uh, we have Rob Sargent here from Massachusetts. He's the policy director for Cultura and um, is going to bring a lot of interesting uh, expertise at a national and state level for, to us. And you probably all know Darren Springer, who is the general manager of Burlington Electric Department, as well as being an EAN board member. And he's got some exciting news tonight as well. So welcome our panel. Here we go. Thank you, thank you, Cara, and uh, thank you, Jared, and uh, everyone else at EAN for putting this on and bringing back the speaker series in person. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here in Montpelier, and uh, as we were describing where this place was, I said, oh, it used to be called Julio's. Does anyone else remember this as the old Julio's? Yep, okay, way back when. Um, so we have a really interesting topic and some wonderful speakers who can go into uh, great detail about sort of the, the, the data at a national level, some of the Vermont data of who are these high mileage drivers? What are they driving currently? What is this all about in terms of a greenhouse gas reduction? And then Darren obviously will, will speak about a very specific program that BED has launched uh, to address this. So understand a bit about the program design um, with that and what they're seeing in terms of um, interest. But maybe I'll start, Rob, uh, with you just just quickly, um, Cultura, what is that? Um, yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, so hi everybody, Rob Sargent, uh, Cultura. Um, so Cultura is uh, a very, very small organization. I call it the little motor that could. Um, uh, <clears throat> and uh, they uh, are exclusively focused on reducing gasoline at scale. Um, and primarily by trying to figure out how to, um, as we'll talk about shortly, uh, make gasoline uh, use and reductions a primary metric in measuring our transportation greenhouse uh, um, programs and uh, make it a primary metric. Um, and uh, most recently, we have developed uh, really an unprecedented data set that it enables us to look down to the census block group level, um, who uses gasoline, how much they use, where they use it, 
what their income is. Um, we don't have, you know, names and social security numbers, but, you know, we can drill down so that we can try to target um, uh, EV deployment programs uh, to wherever possible um, to displace the most gasoline. Um, so. Yeah, and I know that uh, EAN uh, loves nothing more than data, so uh, it's great that you have that. And I know you're going to be meeting with uh, some of the folks on my team uh, on Friday to talk some of that because there is some other high mileage driver interest going on. I will turn this over to you, Darren. I don't know if there's anyone in here who doesn't know what BED is, but maybe it might be worth just saying a few words. Sure. Um, great to be with all of you tonight. Uh, there's a lot of expertise in this room, so I'm sure the Q&A is going to be robust. Um, Burlington Electric is the municipal public power utility for the city of Burlington. We are the third largest utility in the state, the largest municipal. Uh, we have a roughly 65 megawatt peak, and if you think about the Vermont grids, about 1,000 megawatts. We're about six and a half, six, six and a half percent of the state's uh, load. We're 100% renewable since 2014, first city in the nation to reach that goal. And we are working uh, currently on progress towards a net zero energy goal uh, to reduce and eliminate gasoline and, and motor diesel uh, in the transportation sector and uh, reduce and eliminate fossil fuel use in the thermal sector uh, as well. And uh, I'll turn it back to Karen. We're going to get really good at this baton passing by the end. Um, so one of the things that brought us here and brought Rob to this is uh, a recent report that your um, organization came out with called Cracking the Gasoline Code. Um, and it had some data in it that I thought was interesting. And so, so this will be a show of hands. The top 10% of drivers in the U.S., how many of them think, how many folks here think that they drive more than 20,000 or, or 20, miles a year? How many think they drive 30,000 miles a year? How many think they drive 40,000 miles a year? Yeah, that's the answer, right? 40,000 miles. Um, and the other thing, you, know, you talked about gasoline use that was in your report, is among these drivers, so these are people driving 40,000 miles a year, the top 10% of drivers in the US, they burn more than, so here's another multiple choice, um, half of all the gasoline in the US? Anyone? A quarter of all the gasoline in the US? Or a third of all the gasoline in the US? Yeah, sort of process of elimination. Um, so part of that, you know, that your uh, research found was that, you know, the more folks drive, and this, these super uh, high mileage drivers, uh, the more gasoline gets reduced. Um, can you speak a bit more about sort of your study and, and that, that, that real nugget that was found in terms of how you target uh, those, yeah. those drivers? Yeah, yeah so the, the, those 21 million drivers who uh, uh, consume on average, uh, well, the threshold for hitting being in the top 10% of light duty private vehicle drivers uh, in gasoline is about 1,270, 1,280 gallons um, a, a year of gasoline, um, and those 21 million drivers that are in that top 10% that we, we call super users, some people get a little agitated about that, but um, uh, it is what it is. Um, uh, um, as Karen said, use about a third of the U.S. gasoline, and, and um, the U.S. uses 30, uh, a third of the world's gasoline, and so those 21 million drivers, if they use a third, they're, bur they're burning almost as much gasoline as the entire nation of China, right? So 21 million US drivers use almost as much gasoline as the entire country of China. Now, most of that is, as we know, because um, our society, unlike almost every other one, is structured in a way that you have no choice but to use a lot of gasoline. This is the way we've organized ourselves, which we need to change. Um, and we need to focus on better mobility options and others. But in the short term, in terms of meeting it, uh, our climate goals and, and, uh, and, and the other environmental destruction that comes from both from the, from the well to the, uh, you know, throughout the life cycle of gasoline, um, all the other harm. So, um, uh, those, those, uh, so we started focusing on looking at 
state programs and other things and realizing gasoline reduction, even in states like California, which has pretty darn good programs, at least people aspire to them in many states, um, that you know they're projected to reduce their gasoline consumption by about 15%, which is uh, by 2030, which is you know not even close to what transportation needs to do to do its share of the emission reductions we need to meet the broader national targets. And that if you focus on the so-called super users, or I would just make a point, high mileage drivers versus high fuel consuming drivers, which I think, um, you know, if you drive a Prius, 40,000 mi 40, miles a year, that's one thing. If you drive an F-150, you're using, a, you know, three times more gasoline. But those super users use about five times more gasoline on average uh, than the rest of the drivers. So if we can figure out a way, the sweet spot that identifies how to get those people to switch, and some of them can't, either because of real range anxiety or real range concerns or perceived range anxiety or cultural issues. Um, uh, but anything we can do to start steering it in uh, programs, incentives, charging infrastructure in a direction that makes it easier for the people that use more gasoline to make that switch and ideally to do it in a way that doesn't undercut other important transpor cli transportation climate initiatives. Um, uh, you know, we should do that. And so, um, so that's what we've been focused on. We started out just sort of, honestly, we're still kind of in, on the edge of really just a hearts and minds campaign to get people to wrap their heads around this concept. Um, but it's starting to make its way into the policy arena. And just fatefully, the first place that that happened <laughs> um, uh, was here in Vermont, um, where we had started talking with our friends at VPIRG and, 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 um, and others, and um, uh, long and the short of it, we ended up with um, uh, language that uh, authorizes BED to, um, uh, to, uh, to um, prioritize or at least target um, uh, the, the high fuel consuming drivers. So we're starting to do this in, in other parts of the country. We've got a bill in California that we're working on with um, Green Lining Institute, with um, UCS, and some other uh, the clean air groups in California. Um, we've got about 30 environmental organizations signed on. Just came out of the Transportation Committee with a 15 to 0 vote. Um, we'll see what happens in appropriations, but um, we had two Republicans on the committee ask if they could co-sponsor the bill. So, um, or I guess they call them authors in California. Um, and we've got uh, uh, initiatives in a bunch of other states as well, but um, it's really just getting off the ground. Thanks. So turning to you, Darren, so we, we heard these data that are really pretty compelling uh, in terms of how do you sort of micro-target. How did this all come to BED, and where did you say, like, wait, this, this is how we meet our GHG, this is how we do our gasoline reduction? Yeah, and so I've, I've actually known Rob for a bit. Uh, when I was working uh, for Senator Sanders in D.C., Rob was with Environment America, so I, I knew of Rob. Um, I hadn't heard of Cultura. Um, I got a call from Ben Walsh at VPIRG, um, and he said, have you uh, been looking into at all this concept around super users? And I was not familiar, um, and he sent me some literature uh, from Cultura, and, uh, you know, it was intuitively, it kind of made sense that, yes, we should be targeting incentives uh, or enhanced incentives towards drivers that are using the most uh, gasoline, potentially getting a disproportionate greenhouse gas reduction benefit uh, if we're able to get them to convert to an EV. Uh, so I was intrigued um, and uh, interested, and um, it so happened that we had, and I think we have a number of legislators, uh, can all the legislators just raise their hand? Yeah, several legislators here, so we want to offer our thanks. Uh, there was legislation last year. Uh, uh, that was called um, Act 44, and um, that built on a concept that we can use our efficiency dollars in innovative ways, uh, at least a portion of them, uh, to help reduce emissions. And further in that bill uh, was some language that incorporated this concept uh, that said that Burlington Electric had the authority uh, to use a portion of our dollars in this space uh, to prioritize incentives for these customers. Um, as, as everything does, uh, we have some former regulators in the room as well. Um, uh, things take time uh, occasionally in the regulatory process. Uh, so that bill passed. We were able to get the final authorization in January, and uh, we've actually launched the program now 
uh, as of March, uh, actually kind of late March of this year. And we've designed a program to take advantage of that legislation. Um, and uh, I wanted to come here and say we had a rebate already processed, but we don't. Uh, so if anyone knows any Burlington drivers who might be putting, uh, you know, let's say 17,700 miles a year on their vehicle uh, or more, uh, we would love to have them uh, potentially consider switching to an electric vehicle. Um, the, the design for our program is, uh, and, and I think folks know, in Burlington, we have less vehicle miles traveled than a lot of places in Vermont. Uh, for us, it's a little under 8,000 a year average uh, vehicle miles traveled. Um, so what we did is basically say if you're doing 2x or a little bit more than 2x the average, around 17,700, which equates roughly, not maybe in the Prius example, but roughly to around 700 gallons a year of fuel, um, then we can do an extra $250 on top of all your other EV incentives. If you're doing 3x, so 25,300 miles, we can do a $500 incentive. Uh, we can also help do an enhanced incentive for your EV charging station if you're putting in an EV charging station. Um, and we already have fairly strong uh, EV incentives. If you are an uh, income qualified customer in Burlington, you can get a $3,000 incentive already for a, a new EV. Uh, there's great state incentives. There's now the federal incentive, all of which are available, point of sale. You can literally walk into a dealership and get all of these incentives now at the point of sale. You didn't used to be able to do that. Uh, so in the case of some vehicles, if you're a super user, uh, you might be able to get uh, half off or more um, of a new electric vehicle. Um, and that's with stacking these different programs. So I think we're going to learn a lot from launching this. I was really excited when Rob let us know that we were going to be the first utility program in the country. So uh, we share not only a responsibility to try to do this well, but also to share uh, lessons learned as we go. Thank you. And what I really love about this story, Darren, is it's so EAN because it's all about network, right? It's, it's, it was all these folks in this room that made this happen. Um, and it's through those connections. Um, so, Rob, you, you mentioned work in other states. Um, you know, you got California, I think Washington, Maryland, and Vermont, where activity is happening. Um, is there anything, what's created the spark in those states? Why those states? I mean, some of them are th the logical ones, but, well, yeah. Is there anything uh, you can say about that? Uh, well, some of it is, what is it like, you know, um, you, you uh, my grandmother used to throw the spaghetti up against the fridge to see when. <laughs> so it's a little bit of, you know, we, we were just talking to lots of people and then seeing where, 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 um, when, when that light bulb goes, you know, when the, the switch was flipped, all of a sudden people were like, oh my God, tell me more. Um, so um, in Washington state, it just so happens that our, the founder of Culture is based in Seattle and was pretty active there and um, had been doing some other clean cars work. And so I think that's that's how it happened there. Um, the, the program is not yet rolled out, but it's it's firmly planted in the um, in the transportation electrification strategy. Um, and um, so they have the tools with which to, to roll it out. We're told they're going to roll out the um, they're calling it a high uh, High fuel, uh, high fuel consuming drivers, I think, uh, program. Um, and uh, in Maryland, same thing. I, I had been talking to the local Sierra Club chapter there, and I happen to know some of the other uh, folks. Um, Mark Stewart, who works for um, uh, the Maryland Department of Environment, got wind of it, and we started talking and briefed some of the Climate Council people there, the, wh whatever the equivalent of the Climate Council is there. And it ended up as a, re a recommendation in the state's climate plan. Um, uh, and where, where's the, uh, oh, in California, it's a little bit of a heavier lift. We were pushing it there. CARB is, I mean, I think the thing about it that's a little bit tricky is uh, some of the implementing agencies, it, you know, see it as, as an administrative burden, which, of course, it, it is a little bit, although figuring out how much gasoline people use is, you know, not that hard because you have the title when you're buying your car, you have the odometer and you have the EPA rating so you can figure out, you know, we, you know, we, can, we have a widget that can help you figure out how much gasoline people use. So there are ways, there are ways to do it, but we're still sort of working through some of those issues. Um, but in California, we're really excited now because I think one point I want to make that's the most exciting to me about this is that there's really a potential twofer on equity and climate that's um, almost 
almost like um, you know, a match made in heaven, at least for folks that don't live in urban areas that are low income. And so that's why people like Greenlining have finally gotten on board because they're, they're seeing it as, oh my God, this isn't just about you know, rich people and Teslas, this is about helping gasoline burdened families make a switch that's gonna have a tremendous impact on the quality of their life by lowering their monthly costs. And so, um, so anyway. Well, no, that's exactly where I wanted to go next, is to, to hear a little bit more from your data and, and from the, the Burlington experience, who are these drivers, sort of demographically? Um, they're, they're not necessarily the wealthy person in a Tesla, um, but who, who does the data show they are? Yeah, so um, more than half of, the, of that t top 10% in the U.S., uh, um, have household incomes of less than 100,000 a year, 42, 43%, I think, 42% are um, below the median income for a family of four. Um, and if you look at, and, and then needless to say, um, in terms of geography, um, not surprisingly, they're disproportionately rural, um, but also small town America and certainly the, the suburbs and, um, you know, they're, they're they're, uh, they're more concentrated in rural areas, but there's certainly plenty of them you can find any, any, anywhere in, um, in, the, in the country. And then um, the thing that we really have drilled down on is, the, is what we call the gasoline burden. And if you break it down by income, the people that are in this category of the top 10%, those people using 1,280 gallons a year or more, um, if, if they're making 50, households making $50,000 or less, people in that category are spending between 15 and 40% of their household income on gasoline. Um, so um, gasoline gets lost, you know, there's a lot of talk about energy burdens, but uh, gasoline gets kind of lost in that discussion because you don't get a monthly gasoline bill. You know, you just pay 50 bucks here, 100 bucks there, I know, when I didn't have a lot of money, I was paying five bucks here, three bucks there. <laughs> Will this get me to the next place? But so, but it adds up to you know hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Uh, I mean, hundreds and thousands of dollars. So, um, yeah. And I think your your report also had some additional demographics besides income. There was a, a racial disparity between uh, the those that are most gasoline burdened uh, were more predominantly African American than those that were leased, or right? Uh, 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 you know, I mean, most of the super users are white, um, but in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, in terms of gasoline burden, um, people of color um, uh, tend to be, tend to be in a higher category. Um, I mean, tend to have a higher gasoline burden, not just because of their income, but just in general, tend to, tend to be um, super users, so. And this idea of adding gasoline burden to energy burden, I know that there's been work on a total energy uh, burden. Um, looking at you, Dave, you may recall that. Um, and, and thinking about Burlington in terms of the energy burden, the total energy burden, because you know, you've got the electricity, your natural gas, and gasoline. I'm assuming that gasoline is probably doing the lion's share of the work in that burden. Um, but sort of what are you thinking about in terms of the Burlington demographics that will take a, a advantage of this program? Yeah, so we're, we're, we have some ideas um, in terms of, because we don't have any rebates issued yet. So we'll, hopefully we'll be able to come back a year or two from now, we'll be able to share actual data. Um, but we have um, you know, a lot of interest in EVs in the city. Uh, we have challenges around charging infrastructure. Uh, we have a high percentage of renters uh, in terms of our residential customers. You know, upwards of 60% of our customers who are residential are renters. Uh, we have a lot of turnover in our customers. You know, 5,500 to 6,000 customers turnover out of 21,000 every year. We have a big student population. So um, w one of our goals is to have uh, ubiquitous charging infrastructure. Uh, first and foremost, because we know if we're going to convince somebody who's driving this many miles that they can uh, rely on the grid, which we know they can, we need to make sure it's convenient.
convenient to charge. Uh, it's convenient to charge overnight. It's convenient to charge if you need a public station. Uh, so we're doing a variety of things there. We're investing in level three chargers, level two chargers. We have a new pilot program that's gonna put chargers on utility light poles and they're gonna have a drop down option so that they can be used for on street parking in areas of the city uh, where not only do we have more of a gasoline burden and um, you know, that are considered just as 40 areas in terms of the federal government, uh, but areas where there may not be as much off street parking, for example. Um, but in terms of, of super users, um, you know, I used to commute to Montpelier uh, five days a week, the pre-remote work, um, and I would have been a super user in terms of my gasoline use, my mileage at that point in time. So that was at least a useful frame for me to understand, you know, what, what type of commute would cause somebody to be in this category. Uh, we also are offering a, a kind of a program that is complementary uh, for food delivery, uh, for ride sharing. We're, we're thinking there may be some uh, people who are in those categories of work who may be putting that many miles on their vehicle. And so um, our equity team came up with that idea, which is a complement to the super user program. And, um, you know, really, we, we try to have our enhanced incentives, our best incentives be available uh, for income qualified customers. So we're seeing a little over 20% of our EV rebates are going to income qualified customers as enhanced rebates. Um, that number and percentage has been growing and we're hopeful that this on top of that will be kind of an important adder. Um, but I also think it's, it's really important when we think about the future of efficiency too, um, our efficiency dollars. Uh, I don't think we're used to thinking about it like this, but in the future it may be just as meaningful to incentivize a customer to go with a 140 MPGE vehicle than a 70 MPGE vehicle from an electricity use standpoint. So I see this as also kind of an avenue to explore uh, more innovation in our efficiency budgets because switching to an EV is great. Uh, those of us who drive an EV know that the range really varies based on different conditions, winter conditions, and the more efficient your EV is, the more you're going to get out of it. And we're not at a point yet where we're in incentivizing that type of thing, but I, I see this as kind of opening that door. Yeah. I mean, it, it raises so many interesting questions because from an efficiency perspective, an electric vehicle is just a big mobile appliance, and the more efficient you can make it, the better. So this often brings something, uh, Rob, that you, you've heard is, why do we want to be providing incentives for people who drive so much? Don't we want to be encouraging public transit and walking and biking and other, now that's not an option for everyone, but I'm sure you get, you, you hear that sometimes and sort of what's your, your response to, wait, why are we encouraging by providing incentives for these uh, high mileage drivers? Yeah, no, we definitely get that a lot. Like, why are you rewarding the polluters? And, um, and so, um, you know, the reality is there's, um, there's probably somebody out there that would drive a crazy amount so that, and spend more money than they would save from an electric car by, to, to be able to be eligible for some super user rebate, but they're few and far between. Most, as I said before, America's been organized in a way that makes it very hard not to drive for some people. And particularly people who can't afford to live near where they work, don't have the luxury of working remotely, and have to drive a lot, um, uh, you know. So, um, so you, you, you do get that. Um, one of the things that that I'm encouraged about is that was the initial reaction. But as we've been working with a lot of the folks that are concerned about equity and transit, which includes me, um, uh, I, you know, I thought long and hard about starting to work here because it was so EV focused. Until I realized it was a huge opportunity for us to if we do it right, even redirect some of the incentives for EVs away from, right now, the people that are buying EVs <coughs> tend to be people that can, excuse me. Tend to be people that can afford them the most and, uh, and who drive the least. And so figuring out how to steer it in that direction um, will make a difference because if we have any hope of meeting our climate goals, we, we have to do something more than just sort of steady state, get more EVs on the road and, and any of the mobility options that we do short of sort of, I mean, I think, I think sort of biking and walking, but, tr you know, any transit plan that's going to reduce emissions, you know, if it hasn't started already, it's not going to get, it's not going to be reducing emissions in 2030. Right, so we need to start them now or yesterday or five years ago, but you know, so you need to, you need to find that balance. It's just like everything else in the climate world; it's yes and, right? And so, um, 
Uh, that answer? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's this limited pot of funds that we're being able to deploy to make this transition. So being as as precise and surgical with where you put those dollars, because there's not enough dollars to provide in, incentives, right? You're really trying to create that maximum impact with those dollars. So I've been asking a whole bunch of questions, and I suspect there's some questions in the audience. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, Chris. Do you know the vehicle types in that 10% category? And, yeah. and if you do, how much of them are trucks used in a commercial business? Well, so um, we, we just focused on um, privately owned light duty vehicles. So, um, so there, there are people that use those for, you know, for commercial purpose if you're a tradesperson or um, uh, whatever, but the, it, the short answer is a lot of them are trucks, right? Um, uh, but a surprising number, I mean, you know, you have a 15-year-old Toyota Camry and you're driving, you know, 50 miles each way to work and then doing some errands and you pretty quickly become a super user, right? So, um, and those are the people, one of the things that we've been trying to figure out and have identified is and our tool will be able to do, and it, for, for those of you that have questions about the tool, just go to data dot cultura dot org and um, there's all sorts of tools you can play around with and 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 it'll answer all your questions it'll also answer some of your questions about which which you know we, we've ranked all the all the vehicles f-150 is the top one right um, but um, is to identify what we call transition ready drivers so those are people who drive a lot but never more than let's say 150 miles um, a day um, and who live in a single family home, whether, you know, we can get into if they're tenants or whatever, where a level two charger put in, put it, put in their home would set them up. And, you know, really, uh, you wouldn't even have to worry about, you know, um, uh, electric infrastructure. Now that doesn't solve the problem of the multifamily dwellings and, you know, thank God there's other good programs like the street lights or the, you know, what, what, what Darren was talking about. Um, but it's, uh, there's, yeah, so it, it's the data that we think is key for both measuring the programs and then, and then having the information you need about the types of cars that will help us target, you know, how to use, spend these dollars uh, the, for, for the greatest both environmental and economic um, impact. Anyone, yeah, you got a follow up, huh? Just a follow up. Did, did you look at fleets at all? Just individuals. Just individuals. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's much harder to get that info on that. Yes. Right. And I guess it's not surprising the Ford F-150 is top since it's the best-selling car in the U.S. Oh, that's right. So, that's right. yeah, yeah. Other question? Yeah, Rich. In terms of um, awarding uh, incentives, is the, do you have a, a policy break point or, you know, as between incentives for hybrids versus incentives for pure EVs, so plug-in hybrid, hybrid, pure EV. Um, uh, you know, are, is, are super users basically long distance drivers and so they might really want a hybrid or you know, how does it play out? Um, I don't have a good answer. Um, Rich asked, um, how, do we, how do we break out uh, sort of the chunks of people who are eligible for different incentives, or how you would evaluate incentives based on EVs, plug-in hybrids, or just straight hybrids. Um, we're tending to uh, encourage just straight electric um, ourselves. Um, an argument can be made. I think at this point, like hybrids, like I'm not sure that that's you know they're they're really incenti worth incentivizing anymore, but um, you know reasonable people can differ on that. I just add a quick point. Uh, just for our program, we did EVs only. Um, we we offer plug-in hybrid incentives, and I think particularly in a place like Burlington, if you have a plug-in hybrid that can go 40 miles, for example, uh, you could do all your driving in a day, and you'd be good to go, and you wouldn't use any gasoline. But I think when we were thinking about this program, if somebody's driving 100 miles a day. Uh, even the best plug-in hybrid might do half of that, best case scenario. So unless somebody had a place to charge and they were very diligent. So we really think uh, best bang for the buck, uh, 
being the theme, that EVs would be the way to go. And the, the range is good enough now, I think, on a lot of the models that you can really make that, you know, 100 mile, 150 miles, uh, and, and still be okay. Um, but, you know, vehicles are only going to hopefully get better uh, in terms of the range, in terms of characteristics. But we thought about that question, and we don't incentivize hybrids at all. We do incentivize plug-in hybrids, but for this program, it's EVs only. And I guess the, the math also depends on what they're replacing, right? Yeah. Yeah, Dave. Can, can you talk about um, the outreach you're doing? How are you getting your customers in, in Burlington, and how, how's this happening around the country? So in terms of Burlington, um, we do have a number of different ways to reach customers. Um, we, we do all the website, social media, uh, occasionally advertisements. Um, you know, we have North Avenue News reaches every household more or less in Burlington, or occasionally we use seven days or even radio and other things. Um, we do a lot of community events. Um, we try to go to everything from the farmer's market to the Lake Monster baseball games, Juneteenth, Earth Day, uh, any, any type of event we can get to. Uh, we also host an event now, uh, Net Zero Festival, every year that we try to bring customers in and, and provide education. But um, uh, one of the things we're doing is we're working with the dealerships directly. Um, so we have a number of what we're calling preferred dealerships. Um, they can offer our rebate point of sale. Uh, so if somebody comes in and they happen to be a BD customer, the dealership knows to ask, okay, who's your utility? We can get you a rebate. You qualify for this. Um, we have our staff is going out to talk to all those dealerships about this program specifically and make sure that they know to ask, um, okay, are you actually driving the number of miles needed? And we didn't cover this, but I should mention, we're doing self-certification to start off with. Very low barrier. Um, we can audit the program. We can request an odometer statement or registration if we need to. Um, what we found is we're doing self-certification for our income enhanced rebates, and people are not gaming the system. They're being honest about whether or not they qualify, and uh, we have the ability to go in and check. So we're going to try to keep it a low barrier uh, type of program. And I think we do a lot of outreach, and I'm always surprised how much people don't know about what we offer. Uh, so I always know there's more to do. Um, but at the same time, I think getting to the dealerships uh, is one of the key things because they're ultimately where the vehicle is going to, you know, the transaction is going to take place. Yeah, and we're, we're, um, we've, we've got aspirations to really have a, to, you know, to, to use our tool to be used as a, like, super user switching machine. Um, and, uh, but, it, you know, right now, our, mostly what we're doing is trying to talk to like-minded people who, un, who share our goals and understand this stuff and, and, and learn from them. Um, but there are a lot, I mean, I know, like the folks at Efficiency Maine, we had a conversation with them, and they were like, "Can you give us the names and phone numbers of all these people in Maine? You know, <laughs> of the super users in Maine?" And we're like, "Well, we can't do that, but um, uh, but we can give you the census block group, you know, areas uh, of where there are high concentrations of them, and then maybe you could do like have somebody at the Rotary Club do something, right?" So there are, um, there, you know, there 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 are ways to use this data. Um, we're gonna, you know, we have. 240 vehicle records, uh, 240 million vehicle records that we're using, and then we, uh, if people want to know the uh, the methodology, you can go to our website and read that read it. But um, you know, we incorporate AI and to to sort of cross match some of this stuff, and then we you know we have some so, some ground truthing of it with real with real data, and so far it's playing out. So uh, one thing I will mention is. Climate Nexus, um, and uh, we're about to roll out a report that looks at it, does a county by county rural study, and um, and Climate Nexus has been doing some uh, uh, messaging research around trucks and uh, super users, and so we're trying to figure out how to use that data to begin reaching out because even in states without good incentives. The federal incentives are pretty darn good, and if you can target, the beauty of targeting the people that use the most gasoline is they're the ones when they do the math, assuming they don't have the range problems, that are gonna, it, where it's gonna pencil out, right? So, um, so figuring out, even in states without good incentives, how you can harness the federal program um, to, um, to achieve this objective. And, and it's interesting because a lot of those trucks, right, there's the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Silverado has an EV that's 
400 miles range. It looked really interesting. It's too big of a car for me, but it had a lot of features that were uh, of interest. So there, there are options now, but they're also Rivian uh, that have the federal tax credit, but they're also really pretty expensive um, to do that. But so you're able with your data to, in a state, say it's this census block that, or these census blocks that are the top 10 uh, census blocks for the most you know, gasoline burdened uh, or, yep. okay. Yeah. And so that can help your marketing. So there's a handout that, that there that we, we did a quick, quick and dirty, I think it's just a county map, but you know, not surprisingly, if you look at a map of Vermont, Burlington Electric, uh, you know, uh, you know, Burlington has the fewest super users, um, but, um, but, but everywhere has a lot of them. And you know, Vermont has 50, 53,000 people that use 12, 1,280 gallons a year or more. So, um, uh, uh, so yeah, but it will. You can go right down to that, that, that level. So that's really an interesting data point is 53,000 Vermonters, if they were to switch to electric, could make a dramatic difference in the GHG emissions. Yeah, Ian. Do we know how many super users are buying new vehicles versus used vehicles? Great question. We don't. Uh, I mean, I, I can't answer that question right now. We might, but I don't. I would just offer, um, we are providing the super user rebate, uh, not only for new vehicles, but used vehicles as well, because we have a lot of customers. Uh, we have a pre-owned EV rebate. There's a federal rebate, uh, state rebates as well. Um, so getting a pre-owned EV could be a good option. So we are offering it, and we will have data uh, over the course of a year or two in terms of how many customers are picking up uh, you know, a new vehicle versus a pre-owned vehicle. We definitely know that the uh, used vehicle market is, you know, dwarfs the new vehicle market. Yeah, we got two days that had their hands up. Go ahead, Dave Roberts. I'm curious, like, how important do you think having these additional incentives for super users would be as opposed to just making sure they're aware of the potential savings because Obviously, the more someone drives, the more they could save driving an EV in Vermont. It's roughly yeah, a dollar I mean, a gallon. That's a very that's a very good question uh, that that we're we're struggling with because when people ask us what you recommend, I think the most important thing is targeting the people that use the most gasoline and making them aware of whatever incentives exist and having them do the math. Um, uh, I think the incentives are really important because they get people's attention. Right, you know, it's like I used to joke. Like I live in Massachusetts, and they'd have um, tax-free weekend in the, in August, right? And people would all go shopping. I'm like, but if you had a, if you had a, I'm old enough to say, if you had an ad in the paper that said five percent off sale, people wouldn't like go shopping. But if, but if you're like, <laughs> right, like you know, it's like, what? Well, somebody's at a five percent off sale. I'm gonna like drop everything and go shopping. So. Um, uh, so I think the incentive does get people's attention, um, and um, I think you know, especially it, where you can do it point of sale, it can be it can overcome a huge obstacle for people, right? So when the federal incentive became a seventy five hundred dollar incentive that's available at point of sale, that's a well. First of all, there's like a hundred million new people that became uh, eligible for 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 the federal incentives, but then. Uh, because they didn't make enough money to owe taxes before that, but um, uh, but then but then it's also um, you know just you know it's just targeting those folks and making them realize um, how much they can save. And the more gas they use, the more they're going to save. Um, if you're financial institutions, somebody that all of a sudden is going to be spending five hundred dollars less a year on gasoline becomes a better credit risk, um, and so. People that think they can't afford an EV actually can't afford not to have it. If you can get them over that hump of actually the financing and getting behind the wheel of it, um, but these are all the things that need to be worked out, and we're hoping this data will help us ask all these questions and answer them. Did you have your hand up too, Dave? Yeah, and I don't have a, a well-formed question, but it seems to me um, I'm sort of thinking of my experience. I live far away, but I come to Montpelier. I. Or, and people live outside of Burlington, they come to Burlington, they're not BED customers. But those are the folks you want to target. They're the ones who come to Rutland, come to Burlington, come to Montpelier. And I'm just wondering how one might target them 
and provide, provide them with the information they need to, to act on this because it's not, because um, they're the ones, it seems to me here in Vermont, my experience is anything like that, that they're the ones who are the super users. They'll come to the big city. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. I mean, I think we're cognizant of the fact that Burlington is the place with the, on average, the fewest super users. That's not to say there aren't plenty of them, and that it, it's not to say that, you know, um, but we really need to figure out how to crack this. And same thing, like, you know, you could use, you know, Massachusetts versus Mississippi, right, or whatever, right, where there are a tremendous amount of, of, of super users. And so... Um, uh, it's also about proof of concept. It's like proof that, of, right? so that's the thing. We're, we're really excited about the pioneers here. And then, um, and then, and then I think, you know, utilities will start figuring out, like, if you're a utility, you have a stake, right? If, if you sell electricity, you'd much rather have the person buying an EV that you might be incentivizing be somebody that's going to triple their electricity consumption. Um, and then you, you know, you do the math, you can figure out it's worth it for you to literally pay for them to do a panel upgrade and a level two charger because it's going to pay for itself. You have to convince regulators of that, but, um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, which is easier in some states than others, but really hard in any state, really. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so there are, you know, there are, you know, all this information just starts, you know, there's so many players and there's so many ways that people can take this data and, 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 you know, achieve at least this group's goals. Well, I see Rob has his hand up and we got more going up. Go ahead. Yeah, so I remember when this idea was originally proposed to the Transportation Committee a year ago, some people from the administration opposed the concept because we would have to dive down a lot of privacy issues, and I hear the way Darren's saying they're, it's like self-serving. Is there a way we can dive into the data that's out already publicly through the motor vehicles, uh, DMV, to look at and then purposely reach out to those individuals? That's what I want to see. How can we reach out instead of waiting for the self-serving, uh, the self-identifying people? How to, how to find those 53,000? I mean, I, Go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, so, you know, the, the, the privacy issues are real. Um, and, you know, the, you know, the reality is so many people, the private sector is already like, they know everything about, you know, us anyway. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to be the one to sort of break that, um, that vow with the public. Um, uh, and that is that is the question: is how can we figure out a way to do this in ways that um, you know, you know, that that does what you're saying? And um, I, I honestly think most people would like the idea that somebody's calling them and tell them, "Did you know you could save?" Now, of course, they get those calls all the time, and mostly they're full of whatever. But um, but that where they could save 500 bucks a month, uh, you know, net um, on uh, on fuel, um, but. Yeah, we have to figure out how to how to manage that. But in the short term, you can at least I have, know the profile of those folks, and the types of cars they drive, and where they live, and you know that's a lot more information than anybody has right now. Which is, you know, most states know how much gasoline they use because they tax it, and not much more than that, right? <laughs> um, not who uses it, where they use it, how much they make, all of those things. So this data can be really helpful. Hands up there. Yes, Secretary Copeland Hanza, welcome. I, um, I live in rural eastern Orange County, and a lot of my neighbors that I see driving pickup trucks, uh, you know, five days out of any seven, it is a, a single person or maybe, a, you know, a parent and a kid or two in a truck that has nothing in the bed of it. But they need that truck because they need to do something like, I don't know, carry hay bales or take the trash because there's no rural trash pickup um, and so being able to target those people and invite them to think about switching to an EV because my experience with an EV on a very terrible dirt road out in the middle of nowhere has been absolutely fantastic except that I can't throw a hay bale in the back of my car 
Um, so what I think we need to do is couple the, the incentive and the outreach with a, a zip car or a get around in every rural community where you can grab a pickup truck for a couple hours uh, to, to pick up some hay bales or you can run your trash down to the transfer station because a lot of people only have a pickup truck because that's what they've always had and because they need to take the trash once a week. Um, and otherwise, they're running to Hanover 11 and White River Junction on the interstate in a pickup truck that gets, you know, 13 miles to the gallon. Yeah, I remember some old data. I mean, it's back when I worked at the uh, Transportation Research Center, and it was people would buy the car for the most extreme use. So once a year I need to, or twice a year I need to move the boat or the horses or whatever, or the hay, and so I need the car for that too, as opposed to getting a smaller car and, and having something like that. So I don't know if you have any programs on that. Well, I, I was just going to say that um, I completely agree because we have a couple of F-150s now in our fleet, Lightnings, and our uh, crews have been driving them and they love them. And now they're like, oh, maybe I'll, because if you look at our, our line crew, every one of them has a truck, a uh, gasoline truck right now. Uh, it's just a line of trucks when you, when you come in. And they're talking about, oh, maybe I'm going to get one of these uh, personally. So it's, it's the experience of having one can win somebody over. Um, and we even have an electric bucket truck, and they're driving that uh, now in the city. Um, and so I think getting people who can demo the technology is a huge uh, benefit. We've been working with CarShare, as Karen mentioned. Um, so we have EVs around the community that a CarShare member can drive, and it's a little bit of a try-before-you-buy opportunity, potentially. Um, I know GMP has a program uh, where they're doing a little bit of a kind of try-before-you-buy or a monthly lease. I don't know if there are any F-150 Lightnings in there, um, but that could be a, an interesting idea. Yeah. There's another hand up there, or two hands, yes. Go ahead in the, in the red, yeah. I have a couple questions for BED on the design. I was curious how you came to those mileage numbers, whether those came from Cultura and national numbers, or more specific to Vermont or Burlington, and how you came to the uh, dollar amounts that are available. Um, so they were not uh, strictly the Cultura uh, data. We really tried to look at Burlington, and um, we really tried to look at kind of a, a 2x and 3x what the average driver does in Burlington. So uh, as I mentioned, we roughly a little less than 8,000 miles a year for the average driver. Um, kind of level one with the $250 incentive is 17,700 miles. Level two, which is roughly 3x, be 25,300 miles, which equates to over 1,000 uh, gallons a year roughly of gasoline consumption. Um, so we did two 250 and 500 as a starting point um, to see if it moves the market because um, there was good discussion earlier about you know does the incentive move the market does the awareness move the market and it you know it's typically a combination um, I think we have a great pitch to make to anybody to drive an EV in Burlington which is um, number one you can fuel up with 100% renewable electricity um, if you charge off peak we have a rate that can get you roughly the equivalent of 75 cents a gallon for gas uh, even if you charge our public stations, it's going to be like a buck forty, buck fifty a gallon. So still a lot cheaper than what you're paying at the pump. Um, electric vehicles are way more fun to drive. Uh, I know this because, I, like I said, I have an EV. I had to go take it in for maintenance for a day. They had to do a recall. Um, I got a gasoline, you know, four-cylinder typical sedan. Um, I hadn't driven one in a long time, and I felt the difference uh, immediately. I felt like I had no power. I couldn't move. I wasn't getting that instant torque. Um, and then the other piece being that, uh, and this I hope is compelling to people, uh, it's really a buy local opportunity. And I know in Vermont we do a lot with buy local. We support our downtowns. We support our local businesses. Um, we don't think about maybe. Maybe, although EAN has great data on all of this, and I always pull on it, um, the idea that if you spend a dollar at the gas station, three quarters of that dollar leaves the state because uh, we don't really get a whole lot of economic value out of that. You spend a buck charging your EV, three quarters of that stays in the state. Um, it's an amazing economic opportunity. So if we get a few minutes with a customer, we can convey that enthusiasm. That's great. But if not, maybe just the idea that there's a special incentive that they might be eligible for, um, that they're at the dealership and the dealer can say, hey, you're eligible for an additional $500, would you be interested, um, is, is hopefully going to move the needle a little bit. But it's very much a learning opportunity, and we reserve the right to adjust as we go to make sure that it works um, you know, as well as, as possible. That comment earlier that if you said there's a 5% off sale, who's going to go? Usually, you know, $500 off, but it, it gets people's attention and does that. There was another hand back there. Yes. Um, one of my favorite programs in, in recent years has been the Mileage Smart program. Uh, because, and uh, I have to say, I, 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 I called Paul up when it first came out and I said, how come these are not eight EVs? 
you know, and he explained it wasn't uh, it wasn't a gas to EV program. It was an anti-poverty program. Uh, and and what's most important to people is having a reliable car, regardless of what it is. Um, have, have you thought about? I think pickup trucks are almost off the table for this because, it, you know, as Sarah mentioned, if you use a pickup truck for different things that is not replaceable, you, you can't, 90% of the pickup trucks in the state you can't replace with a, a F-150, a $50,000 pickup truck, you know, you just can't do that. Um, but, you know, replacing a, a, a clunker with something that is way more efficient is like, viable and prove it, frankly, you know, in many different places. Have you looked at any of the data for the cash for clunkers programs that have been around? For yeah, I was, was going to say, yeah, I mean, it's almost the, the question is back to why just all electric, right? Because if you get someone out of a 2010, you know, Camry and put them into a Prius, you'd get tremendous savings too, right? But you're going to have some, some data, right? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a lot of data on the cl cash for clunkers, but we have, I guess, you know, it's it's I guess it's anecdotal, which is that, um, uh, you know, we just like just like the transition generally, all things being equal, you want that clunker. Certainly, you don't want it to be something that somebody takes off blocks in the driveway and um, and and replaces it, you know, and, and gets an incentive, right? Um, and then f from our point of view, this is just the choice we're making is that, you know, we're recommending just the switch to 100% electric and, you know, not that in between. That's not to say there aren't times and places where these other things would make sense, but that's, that's not us because our goal is, you know, I, I liken it. I remember there was a moment where when I was, I used to do a lot of state level climate advocacy and I worked with a lot of our state affiliates and they're like, so, such and such group asked us to sign on to this natural gas efficiency program. And for many years we did. And then at one year I was like, wait a minute, why are we giving people lots of money to like get a furnace that's gonna be like 10% more efficient and it's gonna last for 30 years? We're basically investing in, and you know, we're locking in fossil fuels for a long time. So, um, and you know, obviously people have really come around now on, on, on that, but except for the gas companies. But um, uh, so anyway, it's a good question. I, but that, yeah, we haven't really looked at that. Uh, well, so in terms of, you know, for us, we don't incentivize traditional hybrids, but it, because we're an electric utility. Um, so our regulatory nexus is really with the use of electricity. So we can incentivize plug-in hybrid, we can incentivize an EV. I don't disagree that there is a great role, and it, you know, mentioned a state program, and that's very good uh, role to say to somebody, hey, if you need a hybrid vehicle, and we're going to get you out of a vehicle that's a, a clunker, it's not reliable, it's using a lot more fuel, and you're going to save money, and you're going to reduce emissions, that that's a good thing too. Um, just similarly, uh, we we help Green Mountain Transit get electric transit buses, but we can't subsidize the fare because uh, there's a lot of interest in continuing to have fare-free transit. Um, that's not something we can do, but we can help them get the electric buses into the fleet. So our role in some ways, because of our regulatory environment, because we're using our ratepayers' dollars, there always has to be a nexus to the electricity system uh, and benefit as a whole. But it doesn't mean that it's not a good idea you know, more generally. Although I w just one thing I, w I do want to say is if you're targeting super users and they're um, transition ready, which is to say fall into that category of drive a lot but never more than let's say 150 miles a year, um, you're doing them a huge favor by getting them into an EV because they will have less maintenance costs, they will have um, lower fuel costs even with, you know, subsidizing them to buy a Prius or, or whatever. Um, and so, um, so there is, you know, for that, one of the, it's one of the reasons why if you focus on that, that category of folks, you're going to see a much bigger impact. That's not to say there aren't people that that you know that wouldn't be helped by other programs. All right. So not only do you have less maintenance, but you also spend less time getting the maintenance done because you don't need to go in for the the th every quarterly uh, oil change. Um, any other questions? I think we're just about at time. Or there's one back there. Yeah, it's probably our last question, right? Uh, I'm Nathaniel Shope, I'm from Sierra Club. Uh, this question's for Rob. You mentioned Maryland, Washington, California, and other states with these policies in place. 
Is there something about the state demographics or the regulatory treatment that makes states ideal for this kind of policy? Um, well, I think it, it helps when there's sort of a political culture that actually likes the idea of EVs in general. Um, uh, and then, so we're, you know, so this is more like supercharging the programs that already exist, right? So, so that's one, and obviously all those states fall into that category. We would have quibbles in all those states about how they could do it better, but certainly they're better than average, right? And if not, you know, nation leading. Um, just to correct you, there's, there's very few places right now where the policy is in place. In fact, there's only one, and that's, you're looking at them. Um, uh, uh, but but, but we, we are seeing a huge breakthrough in the sense that, in fact, probably when we released the report, we got this great piece in the New York Times that all of a sudden people that were like, what was that thing you were telling me about six months ago? <laughs> Tell me more. And so um, I think we are starting to, it, like I said, it started out as a hearts and minds. It, you know, we're still sort of transitioning from hearts and minds to like policy development. And we need your help to help us think through that, the policy, so. Well, all right. Well, I do want to thank uh, Rob and, and Darren. And thanks, Rob, for bringing the data and uh, the spark, and Darren for being the leader on this issue and uh, really taking the helm nationally. Uh, it's nice to have BED in the spotlight. I got to tell you, I think you know most uh, the headquarters for my organization is in California. So I work with a lot of folks in California. And every once in a while, something about BED hits the press, and they're like, what are they doing there? Uh, so it does make its way across the, the country. Uh, so did you have some final words? Thank you. So maybe a, a round of applause for them. Thank you. And for Karen. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to our speakers. If you would like to see the uh, Vermont-specific report from Cultura, there's a couple copies um, floating around. And there's also some QR codes that would get you both to that report and to the BED incentive. Um, we are planning another speaker series probably the first week of June, so look out for that. And um, I hope you'll take a little more time to chat and enjoy the rest of your evening. Oh, Jared has something to say as well. I forgot one thing, which is I just really want to thank um, Ben Edgerly Walsh, because um, the idea for this speaker series event came from Ben. So thank you for suggesting it. And just uh, also a reminder that um, we are hosting these, com these events to try to have the conversations that feel most timely, relevant, and helpful to the network. So if any of you um, have ideas for future speaker series events, please let Cara and I know. Um, and we will, and you know, I, whether that's a topic, whether it's a speaker, um, please let us know how we can most support the um, further development of innovative ideas and progress in the climate energy space in Vermont, working with all of you. Thanks.